Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John Erickson. This is Persistit, using and abusing Microsoft Fixit patches. I apologize, my laptop somehow does not work with the system, so um, I'm going to be clicking this and this at the same time, so it might get confusing. There we go. All right. Uh, this is me. This is my Twitter handle. I don't tweet much, uh, but you can follow me if you want to. I'm an engineer at iSight Partners. I've been there about three years now. Uh, I focus on looking at vulnerabilities, uh, exploits, uh, look at malware, and a big part of my job is looking at patches, which is what this talk is about. Uh, every Patch Tuesday, look at Microsoft, Adobe, Oracle, etc. cetera. Um, prior to iSight, I was at the MITRE Corporation for five years, and before that, I was at uh, in the Air Force and a couple defense contractors. Uh, iSight Partners is a intelligence threat provider. If you would like more information about iSight, please visit our website or come talk to me after the talk. Okay, so here's what we're going to talk about today. Give a little background about what these fixes actually do, um, some tools they can use to. Damn it. Sorry. Yeah. That was my slide for my company, sorry. <laughs> And this is what we're talking about today. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about some tools that you can use to look at these uh, fix-it patches, some real-world cases where Microsoft has utilized these fixes to prevent uh, exploitation, um, how I went about reverse engineering this fix-it file format, um, a simple information disclosure bug you might want to say that I found while doing this, uh, SDB Explorer, which is the tool I wrote during the, this research, and how you can go about creating your own in-memory patch fix-its and how you can use that to maintain persistence. Okay, so what are these in-memory patch fix-its? They are a subset of application compatibility fixes. Uh, there's a bunch of different names out there. Uh, they, they're called shim databases. They're called app, compat app compatibility fixes. Microsoft has a whole website dedicated to these fix-its. It's the Microsoft Fix-It Center. Um, there's thousands out there. They provide a way to modify an application's behavior, how it interacts with Windows. So, um, for example, if you needed to modify your resolution for some old program, you could have a shim that does that. If you wanted to uh, convert a, an old, uh, you know, Windows NT app to make it work on Windows 7, you might need to change some uh, file. Uh, locations or registry locations. So you can do that all with these shim databases. Um, and EMIT, uh, Microsoft's Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit, uh, also works via this mechanism. So the, the first public uh, information I saw on this is from Alex Ionescu. I uh, made a blog back in 2007 called Secrets of the Application Compatibility Database. Uh, I guess he intended for it to be a nine-part blog series. Um, he only did these first four that I, that I saw at least. Uh, he gave a great introduction on the technology, some uh, system shims that are built into Windows, how the shim engine interacts with the PE loader, and um, he never got to releasing his tool or this bullet here, uh, seven, the runtime in memory patching behavior and analysis. If he would have released that blog entry, I probably would not be here today talking about this stuff. Um, Mark Badgett uh, presented at DerbyCon last year. Uh, he's mainly focused on uh, rootkits and doing penetration testing work, so that's kind of his focus. He wants to do uh, rootkit type things like process execution redirection and API hooking and file system hiding, registry, registry hiding. Uh, he showed how you could disable security features of the OS like disabling ASLR or DEP for processes and how to execute backdoors. He showed that you could do all this through the application compatibility framework that's built right into Windows. Uh, it's a very neat work. He did not talk about in-memory patches, which is the focus of this talk but still cool stuff. So what's the motivation? Why did I want to get started doing this? You know, Patch Tuesday comes out. 
I diff the patch for IE, you find for, for this example here, 465 functions that match. That means you have to look through 465 functions that have, there, there's differences in them. And are those differences security related fixes? Are they just normal bug fixes for Windows? Uh, it's, it's a hard job, it takes a long time. It takes a long time to just load these DLLs into IDA and run bin diff on them, it takes hours. Uh, if you look at a fix it patch for this particular CD here, there was two changes. So within, you know, five minutes of downloading this fix it, running this tool, you can see, oh, they changed this assembly instruction from a jump not equal to a jump, or they changed this to hook this function to redirect code somewhere else. Um, very cool stuff, and that's what got me started in this. Okay, so now let's talk about some tools. Um, there's a few by Microsoft, Application Compatibility Toolkit, SV to XML, and SV Inst, um, as well as CDD, which we'll talk about briefly, and SDB Explorer, which is the tool I created uh, during this research. Damn it. <laughs> Somebody yell at me if I forget to change the slide, please. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so the Application Compatibility Toolkit. Um, this is freely available for download from Microsoft. Um, it's a nice GUI tool that allows you to point and click and create nice application fixes. However, I don't think it's very well documented. I've got a couple examples here um, that I, I just made up. Uh, pointer. So I created a compatibility fix here called ShimVAT which means it, you're gonna hook a function via uh, export address table entry. Um, when you create this to the GUI, it's a nice point and click, yeah, I wanna do a shim via EAT, and then it gives you a text box that says arguments, and it provides no documentation, what's the format for that argument, how do you know, I, I have no idea, so uh, it was very confusing. Um, they have, Fixes and they've got modes. Modes are a collection of fixes. So I've got the top one here is a compatibility fix and the bottom one is a compatibility mode. Uh, what I really wanted to point out here is the concept of matching files. And so matching files for IE, it has to match this particular binary version, company name, product name, etc. If that, if those conditions are met, then this compatibility fix will be applied, as well as the bottom. If those conditions are met, that compatibility mode will be set. Um, now, if we take the same, you know, toolkit GUI here and bring in one of these fix-it shims, um, we see the same matching files entries like we saw in, in the previous slide. However, there's no compatibility fix listed here. There's no compatibility mode listed here. So how do you know what this does? It has like no concept of what these in-memory fixes are, or what they do. So I'm guessing that Microsoft has some internal version of this tool or maybe they use something a little bit different to create these. Um, okay. Um, SV to XML created by a Microsoft employee. Uh, back in 2007, so about the same time uh, Alex was doing his work. Um, this can dump what's called patch bits information. This big, oops, sorry. This big blob of base64 data. You can also have it dump these patch bits section uh, into binary files on, on disk. Um, now it, I'm sorry if it's very small here. Uh, but you can see that this kind of has the same information that's provided in the application compatibility toolkit. It's got the application name, it's got the matching file entries, followed by, here we get a little more information, now there's a patch ref item here. So that means if this matching files entry is met, it will apply this patch ref. And it's got a patch tag ID of 218. But what does 218 mean? I have no idea. This patch up here has no number associated with it. So 
is that 218 or is it the one that's off the screen right now above it or the one above that or how do you get this linkage of if that blob of unknown data is for this particular uh, version of uh, MSHML DLL. Um, <clears throat> CDD uh, from Alex, uh, he never released it. He's got this show patches option. Thank you. Uh, CDD by Alex, he's got this show patches option. Um, it's not clear if this dumped out the base64 encoded blob like STB to XML or if it um, actually parsed out this information uh, in, a, in a better format. But um, never released. Okay, so STB inst, this is a file that's already on your computer. It's a way for you to install STB files. If you're um, if you go to Microsoft's website and you can download the, the MSI to install a fix it, but if you actually extract out what's in the MSI, you'll end up with the STB file. And this tool allows you to install uh, STB files via this mechanism. Whether they're STB files that you create using the application compatibility framework or toolkit or uh, ones that you download from Microsoft. Uh, you have to use the dash P option when the SDB file contains uh, in-memory patches. Uh, you have to be administrator to run this tool and uh, we'll talk about why later. Um, also, a side effect of this is that these items show up in your add removed programs dialog. Um, and Badgett mentioned in his DerbyCon talk, you know, he's doing all these cool rootkit type things but then he has to go and see that his, you know, rootkit fix it is in the admin root programs dialog. So not very, not very stealthy. So uh, these are the default locations, um, and this is why you have to be administrator, because um, STB inst and, and my tool have to write to these uh, two registry locations: HK local machine um, custom and uh, installed SDB. And so what you'll find if you look at this location custom, you'll find entries for applications that have shims applied. So you might find one for iExplore.exe or for WinWord or for Outlook or any other program that may have had a in-memory fix it uh, installed one time. This is also uh, where you'll see applications that have emit applied to them. Um, under that entries in custom, there'll be a GUID you follow that GUID under the installed SDB folder and you'll find um, information like this. <clears throat> this shows you the, um, the description, which is just a comment. It'll show you the database uh, timestamp, uh, the location on the file system where that STB file exists, and the database type, which in this case, this flag just means uh, it's a shim database type. Um, I got bored and I played around with animations and that's all I got, so <laughs> this is kind of like my, uh, my cab ride from the airport here. It was pretty exciting. Um, so this is my tool uh, for installing. I'm going to talk more about my tool later, but um, you give the, the dash R option with the STB file that you've, you've got and you give you the application name. Uh, that you want to shim. Uh, this does not show up in the add and remove programs. Um, it does not copy the STB file to the default locations. I should have, I should have mentioned back here actually. Um, this is the default lo locations that the STB int program copies the file to. So if you're installing a 32-bit patch, it's going to put it in the app patch custom directory. And if you're installing a 64-bit patch, it's going to put it in the custom, custom 64 directory. Um, my tool does not copy into these default locations, so you need to be aware of if you're making a patch for a 64-bit program, you need to have um, custom 64 somewhere in the full directory path. That's how, Microsoft, how Windows checks to see if you have got 
a 32-bit or 64-bit patch. It just checks based on this directory name. Um, okay, so let's talk about some real-world cases where Microsoft has used this. Um, the four most uh, recent that I've seen using the memory fix it type are these. Um, just a quick note, in the news uh, this week, Microsoft put out an advisory about an RTF vulnerability and in their security advisor they mentioned a fix it patch that will help prevent it. That's not an in memory fix it patch that will just disable word opening RTF files essentially or, or processing them. So they don't have to, they don't do an in memory patch. Um, so these, these top three are IE phones. The bottom one was a XML core services bug and in all these cases the fixits were actually targeting IE. So XML core services is a system wide library used by many applications such as you know Word and Outlook. Um, but Microsoft just released the fix, fix it to pr protect IE using that library, not, not other ones. Uh, and we're going to focus on this most recent one um, for the rest of the talk. So this was public, publicly disclosed by FireEye on February 11th, being exploited in the wild. Microsoft released a fix it on the 19th, so that's eight days. Uh, they already had a fix it out the door, which is great so that you don't have to wait till the next uh, patch cycle of Patch Tuesday to be able to protect your enterprise. Um, I, again, using my tool, which we'll talk about later, um, this dash D option will essentially print out all the matching file entries within the database. So this particular um, database file, there was eight different entries that they were targeting. These versions of um, these versions of IE with these PE checksums. So IE9 and IE10. <clears throat> Uh, and just you know a note on that if you don't have the if you didn't have the latest versions of these DLLs and installed the fix it it does nothing for you you have to have these exact versions for this fix it to help you otherwise it it does nothing so let's start talking about how we can figure out what this does now when i first started research into this i didn't actually know about this um this extension to window bug that I'm showing here. And so it was a kind of a manual process. I loaded up IE, I did a memory dump, I installed the fix it patch, I loaded IE again, did another memory dump, and then a, did a binary compare of the two outputs to figure out where the bytes started, where were they different essentially. And um, it was a pain in the butt. <laughs> and this, this um, plug in here for Windabug is, was very helpful. So if you want to play along at home, this was the DLL that I had running on my system when I ran these commands. And what we see here is before the fix it, there's no corruption. That's what this tool calls um, corruption or differences essentially. And so if we see this memory range here, there was a five byte corruption. Uh, if you've got symbols installed, you'll see that this was within the insert text internal method. And the expected five bytes are those, and the bytes it found there were those. And there's a second one. Now, I've uh, disassembled what those five bytes are, the new five bytes are down here, and we can see they're both jump instructions. And I, I don't have it on the screen, but if I would have showed the disassembly of the before fix it installed, uh, you would see that it's a standard uh, function prolog, uh, just a you know move EDI, EDI, push EVP, et cetera. So they're essentially hooking these two functions. And um, we're going to talk about these bytes later, so I bolded the things that I'm actually going to focus on later. The address uh, here ends in 70EF. There is a five byte corruption, and if you can remember those 10 bytes, remember them, otherwise I'll remind you later. 
Okay. So what does this fix it actually do? Um, if we look at what does that jump do, we, uh, we see where it jumps, we disassemble that code, and we can see that Microsoft has, damn it, um, saved all the registers, called some additional function, restored the registers, um, and then it will return back to where um, the jump came from. This particular function that they're, additional function that they're calling increments a reference counter. And this is a use after free bug, so they are making sure that they always increment this reference count. Um, Microsoft actually wrote a blog about this and they say, you know, we know that this produces a memory leak because we're never freeing this memory, but at least it's preventing the vulnerability from expo being exploited because we avoid the free, don't let it ever free. Um, uh, one other thing that I wanted to point out, this other code here did not show up in the check image output as a corruption. And we just saw the two jumps, not this additional code. And the reason for that is the check image extension only considers uh, code in the original image size. So any bytes that are outside of that image size uh, are not considered for potential corruption. So basically Microsoft went to the end of executable code, wrote this additional code, and then just put a reference to it to jump to it. Okay, so let's continue on this quest of reverse engineering, uh, figure out how this patch pits formats um, processed and how the PE loader handles it. Uh, a couple of slides ago, I, I highlighted those bytes in, in bold for you. Um, This number five is, uh, it's little endian, so it's least significant bit first, bytes first. So that's five was, you know, for five byte corruption. We see the EF70, those were the lower 16 bits of that address. We see these are the five bytes where the expected five bytes. This is another five, followed by EF70. For some reason, I don't have that. Um, boxed, and then these are the five bytes that are now corrupting those original five. So this is a kind of a general idea, and let's see how Windows uh, actually parses this information. Oh, I should say that this, this dump of hex right here, if you go back to the STB to XML tool and grab out that base64 blob, that's what it looks like. It's just these bytes. That's all I did there. Okay, so how does, um, here's a very high level view of what the P-loader does when it's applying an in-memory uh, fix it. It uh, initializes the shim engine. It um, resolves a function within the app help DLL called SE DLL loaded. SE stands for shim engine. Uh, within that function, it calls patch new modules attempt patches and um, an apply patch. And the apply patch function is the one that actually does the work of processing this patch bits information. Okay, so here's some pseudocode representation of this function. It takes a pointer to a patch bit structure. This is a, a structure I, I came up with, so that's my name for it. I don't know what Microsoft calls it. Um, but essentially, it's just going to iterate through all of, um, I, I kind of call them patch actions. And a patch action can be either a match or a replace action. Um, so if it's a, a match action, it's just going to do a mem compare of the pattern specified um, for some module base plus an RVA for that pattern size. If it, if it matches, it continues along just fine, otherwise it returns uh, out. If it's a replace action, it's going to change the memory permission of the area specified. So it'll go to the RVA for the number of bytes specified. It will make that memory read writable. It will then copy the bytes that you want into that new memory area and then restore the permissions back to original. So read X here or whatever they were. And then it flushes the instruction cache. Um, It'll continue to do this till it gets to 
um, the end essentially. So along with the SEI apply patch function that we were just looking at, uh, the app help DLL has 195 exports. Microsoft has uh, documented them somewhat at this location. Um, they don't provide uh, any header files for you to use or a library to link against. So it's kind of a, a manual process to, to create those. Um, the code that I'm releasing has all that header information in there for you uh, with all the function names and so it'll save you some time. Uh, this, is, this library can be used to read and write or create STB files. Um, the documentation is definitely lacking. It's, you know, been lacking for many years. Like in 2007, Alex was talking about it lacking information. So one problem I was having with it was I want to extract out that patch bits area, which is a binary field, and you're required to give this function a buffer and a buffer size. And I'm thinking, well, how do I know how big this patch bits area is? Where do I figure it out? And I'm staring at this documentation from Microsoft for hours. Nothing's coming to my mind. And finally, I just brought up SDB to XML and IDA and figured out how, they, how do they do it. And they're using this undocumented function called git tag data size. And that will give you the size you need. Uh, this API does not contain the code to actually parse out what these in-memory patch bits areas are. Um, so that's something we're going to get to. So <clears throat> the SP files themselves are binary files. Um, here's a, a very simple YAR rule if you guys are searching for, for files on your computer. Um, you'll find a lot. There's a lot of default STB files on your computer. They are STB files that are packaged with installers for old games to make sure that, you know, the resolution is set right. So this will get you a lot of crap by using the signature. So it might be better to modify this to look for not only this magic uh, string SDBF, but also look for these files that contain a uh, patch bits uh, tag ID within them as well. Um, so that's something that if you guys are interested in, you can do. So here's the structure that I came up with. Uh, first, there's match operations and replace operations, four and two respectively. Um, you've got uh, an opcode, which is either a match or replace. You've got the action size, um, which is the total size of this structure. Uh, the pattern size for the number of bytes you want to search for or, re or replace, uh, the RVA, um, and then a module name. Now if we take that and apply it to that same hex dump and kind of overlay it, we get to start making some sense out of this data. So we see it starts with the number four, which is for a match. We see 59 is the size of the first action. So if we go to offset 59 in here, we see it's a 2, which would be a replace. So we know that it's just patch bits or patch action after patch action. Um, 5 was that 5 that we had highlighted before, which is the number of bytes to search for. This 4 bytes here uh, is an RVA. And then here is the module name, which is null terminated. And then after the module name, which um, is this pattern to search for. You'll notice that there's this big block of crap, I'll call it, from here to here uh, that contains just random data. Um, and this is kind of what I'm talking about with the simple information disclosure. Um, and so that the module name field is a fixed length of 64 bytes, so 32 characters. Uh, it contains uninitialized data from Microsoft's tools that they use to create these fixits. Uh, they don't zero it. Um, I've told them about this, and they released this last one, and it still had uninitialized data, so I don't know if they really care. Um, I, 
I added an option to my tool, this dash L, and it will go through and grab all that uninitialized data out of each patch action um, and, and save it to a file for you. Um, I've done that for the four fix it that I've mentioned at the beginning. I didn't find anything useful, but maybe someone can get something useful out of it. It's, I don't know. It's either stack or heap data and whatever tool that Microsoft uses to create these things. So it's kind of neat, but um, the fix uh, patches that are created using my tool, I, I make sure to zero this out. Um, so I've mentioned it a few times. Let's start talking about um, my tool here. Um, I've already mentioned how you can go about installing SDB files with my tool, uh, how you can print match entries, and how you can dump this leaked memory. So we're going to focus on what I call printing a tree, printing out the patch details, and uh, creating patches. So uh, this is the print tree option, it's dash T. And this prints very similar information to uh, STB to XML, uh, but there's a couple additions. Besides, it probably looks ugly. <laughs> um, on the left of each tag is a tag ID, followed by tag, and th this tag code here, 705 means patch, 60001 means name. Those numbers there are documented by Microsoft, what they made. But what's, what I think is cool about this is now this is the same information we had before with in our explorer, the match and file entries, and then the patch ref we see is 218 or hex DA. Now we see that this is actually DA up here. So now we have that linkage between a particular match entry and the associated patch bits area um, so we can tie the two together. Um, to view patches, you need to um, use one of these five things, either a, a patch ID or a patch bits ID or a patch ref ID or a patch tag ID or checksum. And so I've highlighted them on this, on this slide here. Oops. Um, so the tool has two different options for displaying patches. P and S, P you use for <clears throat> all those patch tag IDs that I was talking about before. S you'll you have to use with the, the checksum. Excuse me. So this displays out the information nicely. It shows you the module that they're targeting, the, the particular action, whether it was a match or replace, action size, parent size, the RVA where, the, where this is at, um, and then the bytes. So this is going to do a match operation at the RVA, these bytes, and then I show the disassembly of those five bytes, which is, that's just um, the standard uh, function beginning. And then the second action here was a replace action that RVA and makes it a jump. And that's the same thing that we saw uh, using the check image extension. Um, now this, you give the dash i option, this will dump it in a uh, Ida Python script format. I was originally writing a Ida plugin for this, and I th found the process not fun, and um, I was running out of time, and I ended up just making this happen real quick. So uh, basically, you bring in the module that you care about into Ida. You you know run this tool against your SDB file copy and paste this into to IDA, run it, um, and this will print in the console window uh, that it's patching so many bytes at some address. And then you can either go into your uh, patch bytes menu or you can just double click in the console window and it will bring you to the associated uh, code regions where this happens. And so we can see here that um, these two small ones are, that's just applying that hook, that's making the jump and these big lines here, that's where it's putting the additional code at the end of the, the image. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk about how we can create our own fixes. Uh, required information, you need a target. You need a target module or modules. So 
that could be a DLL within the application that you're targeting or it could be the application itself. Um, and a requirement because of that fixed length field is that uh, the name has to be less than 32 characters. So 31 and it needs to have that null terminator at the end. Uh, you need to know the RBAs that you're targeting for either match or replaces and the bytes that you want to put there. It's implementation specific. So I created a, a config file that my tool processes to create these. Um, they have to begin and end with these, you know, tags that I have. You specify the application name. Uh, DB name could be anything. That's what will end up, sh um, that will end up in your registry. Um, when I, when I showed the, the screenshot before, there was one that looked like a comment. It was CVE, you know, XYZ. That's what will show up in DB name. Uh, you can have some comments and there's really three things you can do. There's P, R, and M, R. So P will define um, a new matching files entry. And so within a matching files entry, all I allow you to do is give a target module, which can be a DLL or some type of image name, and option, uh, optionally you can have a P checksum. Uh, within a P tag, you can have R or M, R. R does a replace action. Um, I, I think looking back, I probably should have called this um, a write action. It makes more sense. But when I originally did this, I called it to replace. So it's, it's all over the place now. It makes more sense to just call it write. Um, so write, you have a target module again, the RVA, and a hex string of bytes that you want to write to that particular RVA. <coughs> uh, MRRs does uh, match replace combo. So you give an RVA, you give your hex string that you want to search for, and then the hex string that you want to, to write there. Okay, so I created a sample target that we can go after. Uh, this is included in the GitHub repository. Uh, basically this code uh, loads MSHTML DLL. It does uh, get proc address for this uh, exported function for HTML. Uh, prints out the RBA for you and prints out 15 bytes of memory starting at the RBA minus five and then uh, prints out the disassembly for you. So it gives it something to, some target. Now I, I took that same screen from the prior slide, put it here, and I've got a sample configuration for this target program. Um, I hope you guys can see this okay. But again, you have your application name, some type of comment. Um, then we're going to, I wanted to target this MSHML DLL, DLL within this target application. And I want to do a match replace action for this DLL at this RVA, 50B. That's here, 50B. I'm going to look for these opcodes, which is what I've got listed here. And I'm going to replace that with CCCC. Then I'm going to do replace action for that same DLL at 506, which is up here at the beginning. And I'm just going to put the bytes 1, 2, 3, 4 there. Um, so using the tool, you give uh, the dash capital C option with the configuration file that you've created and dash O to um, just give an output name for the SDB file that um, you're creating. Now this is, this process is a config file. Um, it prints out some debug information. This was really for me. Um, but it may be useful to you guys while you're doing this as well. Um, then we take this STB file. We go back to the program again and run it with a dash R to install it. Or we use STB inst if we don't care about the add remove programs thing. And we install it in the system. Then when we rerun sample target, we can see that at offset B, there is CCCC. So it properly did the match replace. And then we can see that it did overwrite at 506 with 1, 2, 3, 4. And the, um, the disassembly there doesn't really make sense because 1, 2, 3, 4 is something weird. Um, so how does this all work? 
Um, whether you double click on something, whether you run something from the command line, it's the parent process's job to do a create process which calls create process internal and the create process internal determines if the target needs to be shimmed. It goes to the registry to that custom uh, folder, it looks, does this image name match what I'm about to run, then do, is there an associated shim database file for this application. If it does, it sets some loader flags and lets the, the child uh, start up. Uh, the child's P loader looks for uh, a flag that's set and determines if it should attempt to look for shims. Oh, it, so yeah, it uses this to determine if it should look for shims. Uh, so if it's there, it will do that same, go to the registry, am I a target? Yes, there's an STB file for me, apply it. Um, this is kind of very vague what I'm saying here, but uh, Alex did a, gave some details about how this works, so you should read uh, his blog. Um, so for debugging this, you can set this environment variable here, and this is output from SysInternal's debug view, and it's kind of small, I apologize, but I'll just point out a couple things. It has the application name here at the beginning. This says st.exe. Um, just think of that as sample target. Um, then it clears some flags that was set. Then it attempts to do a patch. And it fails because MSHTML DLL has not been loaded yet into the process memory space. Later on, we see uh, SE DLL loaded says, hey, I finished loading MSHTML DLL. Then SE I apply patch actually does the action. It does the writes, it does the match, it does the writes. And it says, yes, I've successfully applied one of one patches. Um, so now let's talk about maintaining persistence. So very simply, we can just target explore.exe. Patch win main, hook it to create process uh, calc. So this is a sample config file for explore uh, win 7 64 bit. Um, you give a p entry for explore.exe because it doesn't have to be a DLL. You give the, I gave it a specific uh, p checksum that I care about. Uh, this RVA here is for win main and I overwrite the first bytes with a jump. Then this is at the end of the image size, that's just my shellcode. Um, included in GitHub is the configuration files for Win7 32-bit, 64-bit, and Win8 32-bit. So if you took this, created, uh, used um, the tool with the dash C, and then, <coughs> get the output from the IDA Python script, load it explore into IDA. This is what basically what you'll see. So before the fix it, after the fix it, it just has that jump instruction. That's all I'm doing. If you follow that jump, this is my shell code. Um, I don't write shell code for a living, so don't laugh at it. Uh, basically I'm just, I save all the registers, I call create process, restore the registers, and jump back to, jump back to main. So what can we do about this? Uh, you can disable the shim engine. Uh, you can do it through group policy. I don't recommend doing this. Uh, it will break emit. It will basically make these zero day fixes that Microsoft releases pointless. Um, but it is possible. Um, there's probably some other unintended uh, consequences of disabling it. Um, you should search your, search your registry um, and file system for STB files. These are Yarbrough provided. Um, your system is going to have STB files. They're normal. Um, they're not all bad. There's lots of, lots of good, good ones out there. But you can use the knowledge you gained today, um, how to use some of these tools to be able to figure out what are these files actually doing on your system. And then you can focus on Okay, I know all these are normal. This one doesn't look normal. What does this actually do? Um, auto runs from sysinternals 
does not consider application compatibility fixes as um, as a persistence mechanism. So whether they're something like I created here, this in-memory patch fix it, um, or some of the things that Mark Badger talked about, uh, system controls does not uh, consider it. Um, I told Microsoft that they should add signature support to SDB files. Um, you know, my copy of Explorer is signed, but yet it lets me have my unsigned code patch it in memory and do weird things. So maybe they should let us know that some non-signed STB file is running or about to run. Um, and this is a feature. This is not something that's making you more vulnerable having this uh, default on your system. Um, someone needs to be administrator on your box to install these. So if they're that far, you're, you're already owned, but this is kind of just a new way that you might not be considering how they're maintaining persistence on your system. Um, and this third bullet is really what is, I think, awesome. It, this provides a great opportunity to figure out what Microsoft is doing fixing things. Um, it's so much easier to look at two changes versus hundreds of changes to try to figure out what Microsoft did to try to prevent exploitation. And um, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, uh, Exodus Intel guys looked at some uh, fixits. I can't remember which one it was off the top of my head, but they showed within a, you know probably a day or a couple hours probably that the fixit that Microsoft provided for something was totally ins insufficient that they could find a way around that to continue to get code exact. Um, and um, so now you guys should know about these tools which will help you um, do your analysis. So here's some references. If you guys are really interested in this, you should read the, the paper that's on the conference CD. Um, lots of good information there. Um, thanks to my wife and friends. Um, my wife and I just had a baby last week. Uh, one week old and I had to leave, which kind of sucked. Uh, so thank her. Uh, thanks to Microsoft, iSight, and Black Hat. And um, this is how you can reach me, my email, Twitter. Uh, and this source code link, this is not on the conference CD, so you can take a picture or uh, send me an email and I'll send it to you later. And I don't know if we've got time for questions or not. Anyone have any questions? Uh, the question was, does the in-memory patch uh, invalidate the signature uh, as shown by Process Explorer? And I don't know the answer to that question. I would guess no. Anyone else? Go ahead. Right. Uh, so my, my, the question was, do I plan on continuing to work on the IDA Pro plugin? And probably not. And I don't think these happen often enough where it's worth my time to try to develop one. I thought it was a very painful process to do. It was my first time ever trying. And um, I've got better things to do. Uh, anyone else? All right, well, thank you. If you've got anything else, you can come up and see me after. <laughs>